Hello, and welcome to this International Society of Automation webinar. My name is Matthew, and I'll be your Global Spec Moderator, and I want to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the operation of the user interface for today's webinar. The large window with the heading presentation in the upper left is the primary window for today. Just to the right of the main presentation window is the speaker bio window with background information on today's presenters. Just below that is the Q&A window. At any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the box in the lower section of the window and click Submit. Your question will be placed in the queue to address when we get to the Q&A session. At the bottom of your screen, you will see additional buttons to enhance your webinar experience. To see what a particular button does, just place your mouse pointer over it and a tooltip will appear with a description of the button's function. Now let me introduce today's presenters. With us today, we have Andre Risteno, the Managing Director for Global Consortia Conformity Assessment at International Society of Automation. And coming from Hitachi Energy, we have Stephen Kozman, Vice President for Business Development and Marketing Grid Automation. And we also have Sherry Caddy, the Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity for the U.S. Department of Energy, the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response. To read more about our presenters, please look at the speaker bio window right next to the main presentation window. And guys, welcome to today's event. And with that, I will pass things along to you to get started. Please, go ahead. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, ISA Global Cybersecurity Alliance, for hosting this. Today, we'll, we'll have a session that's going to cover a little bit of fundamentals on 62443, uh, introduce you to the cybersecurity, uh, securing energy infrastructure and cyber-informed engineering topics, and then dive into energy operational techn uh, technology reference architectures and profiles. As Matt already um, described, we have our three presenters today. So Andre is going to start us off with the, the 62443. Sherry will be focused on the securing energy infrastructure, and myself, Steve Kinsman, will, will follow up with the um, reference architecture applications. So the purpose of today's you know, meeting is really to provide you an overview. Uh, IEC 62443 is a foundational standard for cybersecurity, and we're looking at this to be adapted for various sectors like the energy, specifically the uh, electric sector. Uh, also, you know, Sherry will talk about U.S. Department of Energy's update on cyber supply chain programs, including the SEI uh, ETF work and the activities there. And then, I'll, as I said, I'll follow up with the uh, energy OT reference architectures as a starting point and talk about some exciting um, uh, standardization effort that will start up this week in ISA 99. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, turn the session over to Andre, and he'll get us started. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, so I'm Andre Restino, Managing Director at uh, ISA, and uh, I run, uh, oversee uh, several cybersecurity-related programs. Um, all of them very much uh, foundationally based in uh, the 62443 standards. Our goal is to uh, work with our partners to elevate OT cybersecurity from an art to a science to an engineering discipline, much like uh, safety was 50 years ago. So a little bit about ISA. Um, we are a professional engineering membership society, so we, we are uh, focused on uh, automation engineers, and we have uh, over 15,000 members. We're organized in geographic sections in 109 countries. Uh, we do standards. Uh, we're an ANSI-accredited standards development organization. We provide education to our members and to the marketplace in general. We certify personnel. Uh, do conferences and have uh, publications. So we touch about 350,000 uh, customers a year around the globe. So about the standards. So the uh, standards were um, are um, developed in a standards committee. They're numbered in sequence. So uh, the 62443 standards started out as ISA 99 standards, but we made an arrangement with the IEC to align the uh, the formatting and the numbering scheme to uh, the IEC format and numbering scheme to uh, accelerate the um, uh, 
uh, getting the standards to market. So it focuses on its uh, non-consumer grade operational technology in 16 sectors, uh, and, but not including telecom and finance. So examples are water and wastewater, power, generation and distribution, oil and gas, and others. It was, the committee was formed in 2002, uh, the year after um, the 9-11 event, uh, the engineers in, in our standards groups recognized that uh, cybersecurity could be a vector for uh, creating uh, damage and uh, hazards uh, in addition to uh, you know what happened in 9-11. So it was stood up. Um, uh, today, we've uh, got 15 sections in the standards. There's over 500 normative requirements. There's been 1,000 voluntary members around the globe. Anybody can be on the standards committee. You don't have to be an ISA member. You don't have to pay fees. Uh, you just uh, volunteer as an individual. And um, so uh, we've had folks from uh, uh, liaison organizations such as IEC, NAMOR, WEB, uh, NIST, DHS, so, uh, and in the U.S., ISA 6443 is the most referenced standard in uh, the NIST CSF. So they're organized um, along uh, four broad categories. So there's uh, the only standard that has, um, you know, it's fully uh, modeled. There's uh, uh, libraries, uh, lexicons, uh, a, uh, networking models, uh, terms and terminology, uh, security metrics. Um, so that's what we find in like the blue line across the top. There's another group of standards that addresses uh, owner operator sites. Uh, so, uh, the green line, there's uh, four or uh, five standards there. Um, it addresses uh, people, process, and the technology. Uh, addresses how to set up a uh, cybersecurity program for uh, an operating site like a manufacturing facility. Uh, the standards address anything that spins or moves. Then there's um, uh, standards that address uh, security capabilities at the system level. That's the uh, brown looking row. And uh, it includes um, uh, technical security requirements for establishing security capabilities at four levels. Um, it also has a risk assessment methodology in it. And down at the lowest layer you see in the pink, um, this is uh, security uh, technologies for components, embedded devices, uh, network devices, et cetera. Um, and it also has a uh, security development lifecycle standard that addresses uh, certain requirements that are expected in, uh, in the uh, security, uh, uh, in the SDL for uh, products and systems. So this is another way to look at it. Um, the, the, the standards are organi organized along the automation security life cycle and, and, and addresses uh, three major stakeholder groups. So on the front end of the life cycle, you have product suppliers who design and manufacture the commercial off-the-shelf components and systems. Those uh, products are uh, then integrated or site engineered into uh, site-specific solutions and they're deployed at asset owner sites, then they operate and maintain these systems. So there's a shared responsibility for uh, security from the uh, product uh, supplier to the integrator who installs it to the asset owner who maintains and operates it. And there are standards that address each of these categories. You see them off to the left here. So in 2021, uh, 62443 was formally designated as a technical horizontal standard by the IEC. And so what that means is that if there's an industry uh, sector that's developing functional standards uh, for their industry, um, as they get to the, uh, the topic area of cybersecurity, they're directed to use the 62443 standards as the basis for their cybersecurity requirements and uh, develop uh, security profiles uh, for their sector for that. And so the security profiles are really like a usage document that uh, describes how to use your, um, how to use the 62443 standards for your sector 
it addresses things like terms, terminology, you know, and some of the, you know, the language so that everybody's speaking in the um, same terms. So um, there's been a number of initiatives already kicked off. You know, we work with NEMA and another organization that do that, do the uh, security profile for building uh, building technology, uh, medical devices were addressed in 2015. And now this, this is a new initiative. Uh, we're starting out with, in the electric sector, starting out with substations, but we can get to the other uh, sub uh, components in it. So today, there are component and system certifications available based on the standard. And uh, I run one of those programs, ISA Secure in the shaded area. You can see we're currently addressing uh, the products and systems today, just the product side of things, off-the-shelf products. Um, our roadmap, we've already started, we, we're including uh, IIoT. There's going to be certification for IIoT uh, later this year. And then uh, next year, we're, our roadmap, we, we're going to start these uh, certifications for the asset owner owner operator site and integrators and service providers. Um, so the full suite of, of uh, standards will be addressed, you know, via certification programs and uh, you know, address the other two uh, stakeholders, it's integrators and asset owners. So it's just a list of some companies that I, I've identified, you know, back the envelope. Uh, a lot of these have been certified in and our program, but there's other programs out there like individual certification bodies, and IECEE runs a program similar to ours. And so, uh, you know, this is a pretty good list of well-recognized companies. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Andre. Uh, so, again, this is Sherry Caddy. I'm the Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity at Department of Energy, and uh, I'll take over from here to talk a little bit about the Securing Energy Infrastructure Executive Task Force. Uh, so, real quickly, uh, this task force is congressionally directed. So, in the National Defense Authorization Act of 2020, specifically Section 5726, Congress directed the Department of Energy to stand up uh, this task force and gave it three specific tasks. Um, task one was to develop a national cyber-informed engineering strategy, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, also, we were directed to evaluate the technology and standards used to uh, defend industrial control systems. So not create new standards, but evaluate uh, some of the existing standards, and that uh, has led to some of the work uh, here today. And then also, we were tasked with identifying new categories of security vulnerabilities for industrial control systems. And you know, I think part of the, the driver here is recognizing that for cybersecurity, a lot of the different frameworks and standards uh, used specifically for cybersecurity were created for IT environments. And operational technology is, of course, different, and really honing in on some of those differences and appending the differences to some existing standards and frameworks was, uh, I think, an overarching uh, strategic goal here. So we uh, organized this task force and set it up in the fall of 2020. Uh, we have a senior steering group, a, a senior technical steering group, and, of course, technical project teams pursuing each of, of these three tasks that were given to us by Congress. And we're uh, just about wrapping up the work of this task force and uh, getting ready to uh, publish all of our uh, achievements, deliverables, and uh, some downstream work, which is, of course, some of the activity today. So uh, we are developing this strategy. I'll talk about that a little bit and uh, the other key tasks. And we're about to um, report to Congress, uh, as required by the statute, on all of the different initiatives and uh, deliverables developed under this task force. And I should say the task force was uh, designed to encompass a really broad sector of uh, energy sector, but beyond uh, participants. So we have uh, numerous federal participants in the cybersecurity space, uh, as well as the Department of Energy, uh, the intelligence community, uh, Homeland Security, uh, all participated. We also had um, asset owners, uh, vendors, 
uh, national, the DOE national labs, uh, as well as the academic community. So a very broad set of stakeholders involved in this work uh, participated in this task force. So um, first up, our uh, key deliverable is the National Cyber Informed Engineering Strategy. And the concept here really is to look at how we can bring more cybersecurity to the engineering community, that I like to describe it as increasing the recommended daily allowance of cybersecurity for engineers, uh, implying that engineers don't understand security, but that how can we do more to infuse uh, security into the fundamental operation of, of engineers? How can we uh, get to uh, concepts like security by design? How can we uh, train engineers better to engineer out some of the cyber risks uh, that are inherent systems. And th this comes from a lot of um, work in this area, foundational work done by the Idaho National Lab, really looking at as we are seeing more and more experience with cyber incidents related to industrial control systems, you know, the, the finding is that some of those systems really simply had a uh, fundamental uh, vulnerabilities that were introduced at the design level. So how do we how do we get to engineers? How do we uh, look at um, introducing more tools, more uh, information, more um, availability to help with engineering out some of these cyber risks across the system development life cycle from design to build to operate and maintain. Um, so. You know, ultimately what we're driving towards is really in trying to engender a culture of security. So as, as engineers think about uh, designing systems, building systems, that they're really looking at security in mind. Uh, and, and we want to draw sort of a linkage between the culture of safety that is already present uh, for engineers. How do, we, how do we leverage some of the best practices, lessons learned from the developing that safety culture to help um, infuse a culture of security across the engineering community? So we developed a national strategy to approach that. Uh, as I said, it was directed by Congress. And uh, our, our set of stakeholders that came together, a uh, very broad set of stakeholders across a lot of different communities, we developed uh, a set of five different pillars to look at uh, different activities uh, across from everything from education to uh, awareness to uh, research and development to, to implemented uh, controls to, to really drive this concept of cyber-informed engineering across all different uh, aspects of, of engineering and control systems. And uh, I'm excited to say that the National CIE Strategy is going to be published this week by the Department of Energy. And uh, we'll be happy to, after this, is, uh, this webinar is uh, concluded, uh, we will be sending out that link uh, to uh, the folks that have signed up and participated here. So uh, we're excited to, to see this uh, coming here in June 2022. Um, so, uh, what are we talking about with CIE? Um, you know, we we developed the, the the project team developed a set of principles, uh, design, operational principles, organizational principles that are the fundamental premises of of CIE um, that should be considered for any critical infrastructure project that relies upon a digital control system. So, by principles, we mean the ideas, rules, or concepts that need to be kept in mind when solving an engineering problem. Uh, so the, our CIE strategy will go into each of these in depth, but you know we're really looking for um, things like uh, consequence focused design that is prioritizing cybersecurity for high consequence impact, um, things like uh, planned resilience with no assumed security. You know we can expect that any digital component or system may be compromised at some point during its life cycle, and should plan for continued operation during a cyber attack and after a cyber attack that might degrade digital controls. So things like implementing a zero trust architecture to the greatest degree possible. So each of these principles, uh, you know, is sort of the foundational premises that we built the strategy on. So, um, you know, just for example, what is what are we talking about when we say, you know, cyber informed engineering and practice? Um, I'll read a, a quick example. Um, just and so these are taken from actual uh, situations that uh, we experienced and that uh, uh, the designers experienced in thinking about how to uh, approach security at the at the engineering design level. So, for example, uh, a 60% design review of a greenfield water treatment plant revealed that the design engineer replaced the manual handoff auto switches, which allow operations to operation staff to run the plant manually, 
with a network-based communication device without manual overrides. Uh, the design team elect elected to undo this modification and justified the higher cost of construction with the benefit of assured manual control in the event of a cyber compromise. So that's just a, one example of what we're talking about. We're thinking about designing in security foundationally. So maybe uh, choosing to not to, choosing to have manual overrides uh, in places and not fully digitized systems to where there is no manual option. Um, so. Uh, just moving on for time, um, key premises of our strategy. You know, what are we what are we getting at? Why is uh, why is there a need here? What's the urgency? In researching the problem, the drafting team identified several key assumptions that are used as the basis for the strategy's approach and recommendation. So, for example, uh, we're really looking at dealing with what is called an intelligent adversary. That is one that is uh, apart from a, a you know a naturally occurring event, but an adversary that's repeatedly, deliberately attacking a system. So, how do you deal with uh, what is an increasing threat from uh, intelligent adversaries deliberately attacking systems. Uh, you know, engineers are critical to control systems, but uh, don't necessarily get enough support via education, tools, or applied use cases uh, to help apply security by design principles. So uh, that's another premise that we're working with. Um, also, that uh, that we're looking at um, an accelerated adoption of uh, security by design. Uh, again, trying to align to that uh, culture of, of safety, uh, building that culture of security. Um, and that uh, we're, we're looking at maybe, we're looking at engendering, trying to bake in security at the earliest possible point in the design life cycle. That's the optimal time to introduce cybersecurity uh, into into a system uh, rather than what is uh, too often the case, which is trying to bolt on cybersecurity after the fact when it works uh, less efficiently and, of course, is more costly. So, uh, as I mentioned, we came up, the drafting team came up with five different pillars of activity for cyber-informed engineering, uh, just sort of channeling some of the different uh, lines of effort that were aiming to focus on awareness, education, uh, development of, of tools and, and research, and then applied uses for current legacy infrastructure and, of course, uh, future infrastructure, future technologies. So let me quickly go through each of these. Um, awareness, of course, we're trying to, to build awareness uh, of the, the need, the, the gap that we're trying to fill here of, of introducing uh, more cybersecurity into the engineering community. We're not trying to make all engineers cybersecurity professionals, but, um, but really just to, to create more of an awareness of cyber and how it can, and if, how, how it can impact uh, engineers' work in various stages. So we're doing a lot of outreach work for uh, communities like this one to promote the benefits of applying uh, cyber-informed engineering and get people interested in working with us as we move into implementation activities. Uh, so with education, we're, we're definitely looking at developing some of the tools that can influence how engineers and technicians are educated, whether that's a curriculum, uh, whether that's standalone curricula, infusing CIE into existing engineering uh, training and curricula. And you know, we're very much wanting to partner with our industry employers to make sure that uh, they're providing uh, the, de the demand signal for this kind of training, which, which certainly they are, and that, uh, that, that, that those that are providing training are able to, to meet that signal with uh, courses that have this blended view of cybersecurity and engineering. So we're looking at uh, developing uh, that curricula and uh, infusing uh, CIE into things like uh, you know, professional certifications where appropriate, um, things like uh, existing training requirements, knowledge, skills, and abilities, uh, definitions, all of the above with education. With uh, development, we're looking at uh, this is this is where where do we need to build the body of work, uh, research and development. Uh, of course, our DOE national laboratories are front and center with uh, helping us provide uh, that work. Um, how can we start to develop the repository of of tools, best practices, lessons learned, case studies, other other uh, t other uh, 
resources that uh, the engineering community can tap into and use for this uh, to help them um, in infuse CIE into their work. Of course, uh, we're very interested in applied uses. We have a long life cycle in the energy sector as well as other sectors. So how do we, how do we apply CIE principles to existing legacy architectures? Um, and what are the priorities for that? One of the methods that uh, we have for the Department of Energy that is also led by Idaho National Labs is the uh, consequence enabled cyber informed engineering. That's a, an approach, a training approach that allows uh, engineers to look at red teaming their own systems and determining what are the the highest uh, priority impacts. What are the what are the most what if you were to, if you were attacking your own system, how would you do it? And then taking that knowledge and then turning it into the prioritizing the best way to protect your system. So how can we uh, look at um, infusing cyber informed engineering into into these existing systems and prioritizing them uh, for for better hardening and resilience? And then of course uh, for newer systems, how can we infuse uh, CIE into uh, the design of systems. Of course, we are embarking on uh, what's been described as a once-in-a-generation um, uh, implementation of infrastructure spending through the infrastructure bill that passed, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed last fall. Uh, we're, we're investing a lot in uh, bringing certainly renewable technologies into the grid, um, introducing more uh, renewables, introducing new technologies, um, whether that's 5G, uh, other other technologies, additional um, uh, machine learning, AI, ML. Uh, how, how as we're introducing new technologies, new architectures, new fundamental uh, fundamental impacts to how the grid is designed and operated. That's the point at where we want to introduce. Uh, cyber informed engineering again at that earliest stage of development to be most effective. So uh, we're definitely focused on this as well. So that's the real quick tour of the five pillars. Um, and you know, even though we uh, uh, did this as a task uh, directed tasking from Congress, uh, directed to the Department of Energy, we recognize that these are fundamental principles that can apply to any type of engineering. Uh, any type of engineering, any type of system, obviously systems are quite interdependent among one, one another, uh, certainly energy, water, um, communications, all of these things are interdependent for critical infrastructure. So we're really looking at developing broad tools, uh, approaches, uh, lessons learned that can be applied broadly to uh, lots of different types of, of engineered systems. And uh, we are at the stage of being able to uh, report some early adoption for CIE within the community. Uh, we're pleased that uh, several universities that we've been working with uh, for the last couple of years are starting to integrate CIE concepts into their existing course offerings. Uh, the first out of the gate is, of course, Boise State, working with Idaho National Lab, is uh, offering a uh, CIE course this summer. And so that's our first course offering, but we're also working closely with other schools, uh, University of Texas, San Antonio, Auburn, and some other uh, engineering schools to look at how can we uh, start the process of infusing CIE into some of their offerings so that that work is underway. Um, we uh, are also infuse, you know, doing demonstrated examples of CIE in some existing national lab projects. For example, uh, there's you know work currently underway on developing portable nuclear microreactors for the Department of Defense. Uh, that uh, CIE principles are being used as a foundation for developing that that new project uh, at a design stage. Um, uh, again, a lot of federal agencies are using the, uh, the the method I described earlier, consequence driven cyber informed engineering, to red team their systems and uh, develop uh, prioritized uh, security based on that assessment process. And um, I'm pleased that uh, the Department of Defense has recently added a control system security specialist to their defense cybersecurity workforce framework. And uh, they're looking at uh, 
using CIE as the, the organizing construct for uh, developing the knowledge, skills, and abilities used for this new role within their workforce. So they're keen to elevate uh, the importance of OT security uh, for the Department of Defense uh, operating as many control systems as they do. So it's great we have some early adopters that are already giving us uh, positive use cases of implementing CIE across a number of different ways. And uh, okay, so concluding on CIE, um, just one more mention, the Department of Energy, again, directed by the bipartisan infrastructure law last fall, is beginning to take a lot of its uh, cybersecurity and cyber supply chain related work with industry and organizing it into a broader construct called the Energy Cyber Sense Program. Again, this is congressionally directed, and we're going to use this as the um, overarching uh, framework to talk about our um, different initiatives to um, operate what I, you know, what my DoD friends call left of boom. That is. Uh, looking at discovering cyber vulnerabilities, mitigating them uh, before the adversary can uh, can take advantage of them, and of course, moving further left of boom, ideally engineering out cyber vulnerabilities. So all of that, all of that left of boom activity is being organized under the Energy Cyber Sense program, including um, DOE's Cyber Vulnerability Testing Program, Citrix, Cyber Testing for Resilient Industrial Control Systems, uh, we have some uh, pilot work with bills of materials, hardware, software, bills of materials, of course, uh, with some direction under Executive Order 14028 from May of last year. Uh, we also have other executive orders that we're working with related to cyber chain activities and, of course, the work of the Securing Energy Infrastructure Executive Task Force. So all of these things started independently, but uh, we are bringing them together under this new Energy Cyber Sense program, and we are soon to be publishing a strategy showing how all of those things will integrate. So I'm um, excited that all of this work is happening. We want to make sure that it's all um, working together. We're sharing common governance artifacts to make sure that we're optimizing uh, our execution of many initiatives related to this work. So with that, let me turn it over to Steve. Yeah, thank you so much, Sherry. I never get tired of, of hearing this. This is really exciting for our industry and, and the effort that has gone into this is, is, is tremendous. So uh, definitely, as you said, you know, security, we want to make that the new safety. And, and this foundational requirements around CIE is, is extremely important for us to move forward. Anyhow, um, let me move on. So Steve Kunzman, Hitachi Energy. I'm part of the grid automation team in North America. I lead the automation and communication technical organization. I've been in the electric business for a very long time, about 38 years, and have seen it all. Uh, what I can say is 15 years ago, I couldn't even spell cybersecurity. And now you can see where we, we've moved from an industry perspective. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, the uh, reference architectures, but I think from a, a standpoint of where are these coming from, uh, it, it's really important. Yes, yes, CIE is definitely the framework and this base of uh, knowledge that, that's behind uh, a lot of the things that we will do you know, moving forward from a cybersecurity perspective. When you take a look at various parts of these blocks here, um, definitely we can see you know, that you know, the system architectures that are here, looking at consequences of these systems to see how adversaries could pot potentially penetrate our cyber assets, our digital you know, aspect of this. And then we introduce this consequent-driven cyber-informed engineering um, you know, from this perspective. And it's a methodology on how we look and we, we take the framework of CIE and start to look and assess our systems and, and look at what the adversaries are trying to target, what is the risk behind that you know, target uh, and penetration. And then the most important thing is once we understand this, we can look at our system and say, you know, do we tolerate the risk or do we need to put more security features around this and put the mitigations and protections in place? So again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on consequent driven or CCE, uh, but the whole concept falls together uh, and, and comes together to be able to be the foundation as to why we want to drive this forward. So working closely um, with the CCE and the CIE, 
Uh, part of the securing energy infrastructure um, you know, technical project team that was focused on evaluation technologies and standard, my co-chair in this effort was Sam Chanosky, and we looked at this from many different aspects. A lot of standards that we looked at, we also tried to you know, um, see if there was other you know, reference architectures that we could use for the electric energy sector. And what we quickly found out is, you know, there are some good standards out there, but not everything is, is contained in there. So we developed also this process flow that starts to line up with the CCE and the CIE parts when we look at uh, a security implementation. Where do we start? And the important part of that is the reference architecture. It's the very first thing that we want to have a common language behind that we can communicate and understand what the various components of our security solution, what are the cyber assets, you know, and what are the, the different layers of, of this reference architecture on where these cyber assets reside to be able to then make an assessment and, and see if we can develop a profile that starts to become the template for these OT systems. Uh, this is the starting point for all the effort, and this is the output that has come now from the securing energy infrastructure and I'll talk a little bit more about the relationship with ISA in a couple of slides. So once we have the reference architecture and the profiles are developed for the specific applications in the electric sector, we start with the security um, you know, concept. And this is really the high level security requirements. And then once we have this defined, then we, we can start to drive a system architecture and then to start defining the interfaces, the cyber assets and so forth that need to be able to be in this design. A key step in this, and this is where assessment comes in to look at what are the different assets, what are the hazards if an adversary would penetrate this asset, and in the electric sector, a substation, if you would have a protection control device that's sitting on a breaker, you know, from that perspective, that's probably one of the, the assets that we need to protect the most, and then make sure that we put our defense and tech uh, architectures around this to make the adversaries extremely difficult to be able to access that device. Uh, and then once we're comfortable with the risk that, that is tolerated in this based on this hazard and consequences analysis, then we can go forward into the implementation. If there's a cyber asset that doesn't have the necessary security features, and we need to go back to the drawing board and either select a different cyber asset or put additional security features around here, here's where the risk assessment loop would, would you know, identify that and say that we can't proceed forward with implementation. We need to go back to the security architecture or the design and do rework on that. So this is the basic premises that starts to line up with CIE uh, and be the foundation and the fundamental steps that we need to take on developing these type of architectures. Uh, and I think it's really important that we understand this process flow because this is also lined up quite, um, uh, quite much aligned with the 62443 process uh, on delivering a secure solution into um, the ICS domain. Okay, so as I said, what is the reference architecture? The reference architecture is basically the, this diagram uh, that does not have a specific application in mind. Uh, what we performed inside the um, Securing Energy Infrastructure technical project team on this was to then adapt this for different profiles of application used in the production through the delivery and consumption uh, of electric energy in the utility space. So we have developed profiles for the substation the generation facilities, uh, distributed energy resources, and then also very critical is the, the uh, enterprise and operation control center of, of these facilities. And this is where we, we looked at the Purdue model and, and selected this. We, we made some modifications. So in Purdue was focused on manufacturing, but here for the electric sector, we wanted to make this very consistent or familiar to those in the uh, electric energy business so on the physical asset zone, which was manufacturing zone, and then we also uh, changed some of the names on the levels you know, to be more consistent. So here, when you can take a look at this, the process level is really what's connected to our primary equipment, our breakers, our transformers in, in a substation, if I use that example. Um, and then as we move up, the protection and control IEDs are in level one. So the, these are how we're gonna start looking at the interfaces and the cyber assets with inside this reference architecture to be able to identify the security features that are going in there. And then what are the different participating parties? So again, this is a template uh, that, that is now uh, going to be 
moved over into the ISA 99, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We had the kickoff meeting this week for that, and I'll give you some information if you're uh, interested in that. But again, the reference architectures for the substation was developed with this in mind to be able to look at these various elements from the control center into the substation um, and, and how this information is, is flowing back and forth. The other thing, uh, evaluating technologies and standards, and here's where my co-chair, Sam Chinoski from INL, did a lot of effort on looking at the various standards that exist in the industry. And you know, so, so when we looked at this type of work, when we move into the ISA 99 Working Group 14, we're not gonna focus on the 27,000 part of the standard, that's really IT and enterprise level, but we are focused on the various standards that are applicable to the OT system. And here you can see 62443 does encompass a lot uh, of the requirements that are no both technical for a, a you know, cyber asset and the product itself from a development perspective, from a system integrated perspective, and then also from the asset owner perspective. Um, so we also want to leverage some, some of the work that's going in inside IEEE, as well as work that's in the IEC uh, domain. 62351 is a great communication cybersecurity standard for that. And we'll also want to not only look at you know, some of the NIST work, but especially the cybersecurity framework, which is an, important for us to all tie back to from our you know, architectures and implementations. Uh, speaking of the NIST cybersecurity fr framework, um, here, as you can see, you know, a lot of uh, the, the applications that are identified in the NIST cybersecurity frameworks already have mappings to 62443. So this, this already exists from that perspective, but why do we pick 62443? Um, especially coming from the industrial control system side, and, and I always hear that, well, your automation systems in an industrial facility are much different than, than those in the electric system. Yes, from you know, the type of physical process that you're connecting to and, and protecting, I fully agree, but from a foundational perspective, 62443 does provide this foundational standard that we can use because they're both OT systems and a lot of uh, the maturity that is in 62443 roots from ISA 99. So it is a, a viable standard that we've identified inside the work. And then also yeah, a lot of the effort that has been put into the, the cybersecurity framework, I, I think is in, very important and plays a, a critical role in moving this forward. So why 62443? Um, one thing new, Andre provided you with these four categories. There are two new parts uh, that are uh, under development right now in 62443. The first part is this 1.6, which is the requirements for developing 62443 profiles. And this allows us to take that substation profile and then start to look at the security features that are needed within that and start doing an application mapping of that electric system substation on the 62443. So here is where the part five of the standard is also being introduced that then has applying 62443 to our electric energy uh, OT environments. So this is our goal inside um, you know, the dash five and the effort that we plan to start up with inside the ISA to be able to take this output from the uh, securing energy infrastructure and then be able to move it into a standardization uh, application that's available for both the IEC, IEEE, and, and the global community. So again, very exciting. And you know, 62443, uh, as Andre said, is this foundational standard that can yeah, move the needle on this application area. So um, my last slide here, and then I'll talk about some takeaways. So again, really excited to start up this work. Uh, there was an agreement uh, from you know, DOE and the ISA to host this, to be able to develop these profiles under Dash 5. Uh, we have been uh, formally approved at uh, the beginning of June to start up working group 14 uh, that, that will now take and standardize these uh, energy, electric energy OT uh, profiles into 62443. Uh, some of the requests from DOE is, is definitely that you know, we want to be supportive of ISA, and ISA 99 will be the hosting organization. Uh, these pro profiles will be published for your use, so it's not going to be for fee standard. ISA would appreciate if other industry organizations use them, that, that we appreciate the attribution you know, to the effort that's going on at ISA. 
And also, I think really important, rather than reinventing the wheel all the time, if this standard and the profiles are developed, that they're referenced, embedded, or changed as needed to be able to make it applicable for your particular need and stuff like that. So again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, June 16th, this Thursday, we will have our kickoff meeting for the ISA Working Group 14. Uh, if you're interested in participating in this effort, uh, I'll quickly jump down to this, uh, reach out to Elenia, uh, and then she will send you some information to be able to fill out. And you know, hopefully that, that is done expeditiously so you can make it in time for the meeting. Uh, we are seeking you know, people from key stakeholders from the industry, from the IEC, the uh, IEEE, uh, utilities, OEMs, as well as system integrators, uh, because we want to be able to fast track this. Our ambition is by the end of this year that we have some profiles that are put into action and, and start to use in the industry. Uh, we've already reached out to the IEEE, PES, PSCCC, which is the cybersecurity and communication um, for the IEEE, and then also TC57 Working Group 10 has also been solicited on this activity. So again, we're, we're really excited about this and uh, looking forward to start the effort. Uh, I will be co-chairing this along with my industry peers, Herb Falk from OTV Consulting, and then Dennis Holstein uh, from Opus uh, Publishing. So with that, I uh, just wanna leave you with some takeaways and then we'll go ahead and answer uh, some of the questions that you have pushed up. So again, the key thing is from an electric energy OT perspective, yeah, definitely 62443, we will benefit from the maturity uh, and, and how long the standard has been around. And how we apply it to the uh, electric energy is, is for these profiles to be this interface to be able to start putting that into place. Um, really important here, 62443, as Andre mentioned, it's just not for the industrial sector. It's starting to be applied as foundational cybersecurity framework for many different sectors, and we plan to utilize this for the electric energy as well. Um, energy OT system resources developed by DOE Securing Energy Infrastructure Task Force. Okay, so we want to be able to leverage this work that has you know, been starting point. What I will acknowledge, this was done in a, a very small uh, with you know, stakeholders, as Sherry said, from the industry, but it was not done in a wide audience. So the ISA 99 Working Group 14 effort that we're doing now is our intent to take that to a larger stakeholder, uh, wider audience, to be able to get you know, the, the worldwide recognition and the support from the industries coming from both IEC and IEEE to make this a success. So with that, uh, again, I thank you for participating in this, and uh, Matt, we'll turn it back over to you to pose some questions to our panel. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you all for that great presentation. A lot of exciting stuff coming up. Uh, this, is, this is great. All right. And to the audience, uh, we're now moving into the Q&A session. Uh, we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can before the close of the event. Uh, we do have a large audience, and we have a lot of questions that came in. So thank you so much. Please keep them coming. And, or if you have a comment, we'd like to hear that as well. Uh, if we don't get to your question for whatever reason during today's session, we will have an answer for you following the webinar. Uh, so we will provide answers if we don't answer them today. Okay, let's see what we have for our first question. Okay, here we are. Here's our first question from the audience. Is the CIE strategy just focused on the energy sector? Guys? Yeah, uh, thanks, Matt. Um, so while the CIE strategy, the formation of the CIE strategy was directed to the Department of Energy by Congress, we recognize that there's a lot of interdependency amongst sectors that use control systems. And so uh, certainly DOE is, is doing this strategy as, as directed, but we, we wrote it to be deliberately broad so that it could apply to any other uh, sector with uh, critical infrastructure, industrial control systems. So as we move into implementation, we definitely want to broad, broaden the, the base of uh, interested parties, of participants, uh, to anyone who's interested in um, cyber-informed engineering, education, tool development, applied uses. So we will be casting the net very broadly uh, as, we, as we move to implementation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that. And thank you for that question. Please keep them coming. Okay. And our next question. 
Okay, here it is. Um, why was the Purdue model selected for the reference architecture effort? Uh, I'll take that one, Matt, and that, that's a great question. Um, so, so we acknowledge that, that Purdue um, has some challenges as we start looking at future applications like virtualizations and, and cloud architectures. Uh, but but when, when Sam and myself were looking uh, inside the uh, evaluating technologies and standard effort for a reference architecture that could be used, uh, we, we found some documents that were referencing uh, from DHS uh, CISA or from NIST back to DHS CISA cybersecurity best practices. And in there for the energy sector, they had a architecture that was you know, based on Purdue. So we used that you know, as the starting point uh, because we did have that citation back to uh, you know, applications that were already in the energy sector. And when we, we looked at this and started applying these different you know, profile and applications on there, it fit quite well with what we have for, I would say, 98% you know, of our install base in, in you know, generation substations control centers. So it was a, a good you know, starting point. Uh, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. Uh, but we will take this and identify gaps that we need to, to address in the profile effort in ISA 99 to be able to make sure that we cover any deficiencies that it may have. So, great question. Excellent, thank you for that. Okay, and to the audience, we are in the Q&A session. You still have an opportunity to submit your question. You can do that by entering it in the Q&A box and clicking Submit. And as mentioned, we're gonna to try to answer as many questions as we can before the close, but if we don't get to your question for whatever reason, we will reach out after the webinar. Okay, now for our next question from the audience. Okay, and here it is. What is the next profile to be developed after the substation profile? Um, I'll, I'll handle that question, Matt. So this is Steve Hunsman. Um, inside the uh, securing energy infrastructure, uh, we, we focused due to the time limitations uh, and the resources that we had. So we focused on the substation uh, generation, distributed energy resources, and then the operations or, or the, the control center. So, so those are the starting points that we will then take into the ISA 99 working group. Uh, we do, however, acknowledge that distribution automation and virtualization are, are some of the other areas that, that we need to look at as part of this. But from a priority perspective, you know, the, these four that I, I had on the slide in my reference architecture diagrams will be the ones that we start with. Uh, and, and then we can continue the effort to con develop additional profiles as a need or the group drives us and directs us to that. Excellent, thank you for that. Okay, and now for our next question. What is the role of IIoT and cloud in CIE? Uh, thanks, Matt, that's a great question. And um, if you uh, recall back from um, my remarks, you know, one of our key focus areas is looking at uh, applying cyber-informed engineering to new technology and architectures. So certainly uh, everything is moving to, you know, be virtualized. We're, you know, very interested in understanding how that will impact uh, security overall for both the energy sector and other control systems. So the industrial Internet of Things, uh, virtualization uh, will be focal, focal points as we look at how to apply cyber-informed engineering to new technology. And of course, the goal is with introducing anything new is, is are, these, are these new emerging technologies um, an opportunity for us to, to build security in at a foundational level? And so uh, that, that certainly would be the focus. But yes, as we move to implementation, uh, those are very front of mind as critical emerging technologies uh, for the energy sector as well as other critical infrastructure control systems. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Oh, please Matt, go ahead. Add to that if I could. This is Andre. So um, uh, we've done uh, joint studies with uh, the ISA GCA and the ISA Security Compliance Institute to look at the applicability of the 62443 standards for securing IIoT devices and then IIoT systems or solutions. Uh, we published the first report um, 
It can be found on the ISA GCA website. It's for free, downloadable, 87 pages that address the um, IIoT uh, devices. So that's uh, uh, embedded devices um, and gateways. And so if you look at the applicable standards, there's about 120 requirements, and the report concluded that all but four of the 120 requirements work for IIoT devices, and that because of the unique characteristics of IIoT devices, that 16 additional requirements would need to be added. So out of 120, there was four exceptions and 16 extensions. So that's a pretty big um, Pretty, pretty shows pretty good coverage, <clears throat> and we're uh, going to pu uh, publish a follow-on report that includes the cloud provider uh, that looks at things like you know um, software as a service, you know functions as a service, that sort of everything, and that should be out in uh, September to November time frame. <clears throat> but um, yeah, this, we're we're figuring out the 6443 standards can work. Uh, for uh, the IIoT devices and solutions. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you both. Okay, and to the audience, we are going to try to answer a few more questions, but if you have any last questions or comments, uh, now would be the time to submit them. You can do so by entering in the Q&A box and click Submit. Thank you. Okay, now for our next question. Uh, will this initiative cover nuclear energy generating assets? Yeah, Matt, I'll, I'll try to cover that. So gr great question as, as well. Um, so I, I would say the initiative, you know, it's to be determined. Uh, and, and from a generation perspective, you know, the, the control systems are, are similar, but there's a lot of additional requirements to go into a nuclear facility. So what we need is the domain expertise to come you know, into the working group to be able to provide insight on that, that we can make that assessment whether or not yeah, this type of architecture work is applicable or not for the type of systems that go into the nuclear facilities. So to be determined, but uh, certainly not out of scope. Uh, it, it, any system that's used in the generation through the distribution and consumption of energy should be part of this activity. Excellent, thank you for that. Okay, now for our next question. And this question was posed to Sherry, and here it is. Did the cyber-informed engineering also target ICS product manufacturers? For example, mandating and recommending secure by design principles and SDL processes during the development of ICS controllers, IAOT devices, software, and et cetera. Or was the target mainly asset owners and end users? So that's a great question. And you know the answer is all of the above, that certainly uh, as we think about cyber-informed engineering, building in security by design, of course, we, you know, we're working closely with uh, manufacturers of, of hardware and software used in, in control systems, but also asset owners and, um, you know, ensuring that as they purchase systems, configure them and are responsible for maintaining them, all of these are part of the system development life cycle. So uh, we're looking to really cut across a broad swath of of engineers uh, that are designing products and maintaining products. So uh, all of the above. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, and to the audience, we have time for one more question, but again, now is definitely your last time to submit any last questions or comments. Like mentioned, if we didn't get to your question today, we will reach out following the webinar. And okay, now for our remaining last question. Um, here it is. NIST has issued several sector-specific guides, such as IR7628 guidelines for the smart grid and SP11084 of a similar nature. Will these standards be leveraged as part of the new ISA WG? Yeah, Matt, that's also another great question. So, Mr. 7628, yeah, that. that really was one of the first fast-tracked um, security documents that was focused on the electric sector. As I mentioned, you know, 15 years ago, we could not even spell cybersecurity, and then came all these smart grid deployments, and then the light bulb went off. How are we gonna map all these things together and what security requirements are on there? 
So I would say from that perspective, Mr. 7628 is also core behind a lot of the standards that are being developed in IEEE um, and plays a role for sure. Uh, how it will be applicable into this specific uh, work, uh, we're, we're not closing out any you know, security standard you know, from that perspective, uh, but we need to look at you know, what the relevant ones are, and then as a group we'll decide what gets you know, pulled in and, and used uh, to be able to cite. The other thing is we, we acknowledge that uh, 62443, as I mentioned, is, is not perfect. So there will be gaps identified you know, that, that may not necessarily be applicable uh, or, or we need to add to, to an energy, electric energy, uh, OT environment. So whether that's done in 62443 or we go back to IEC 6251 or C37240 from the IEEE, yeah, this is definitely something that we will need to liaison with these groups to be able to make sure that as we identify gaps, we have the best home for them to be filled. So great question again. That's good. Uh, if I might, uh, just two points I want to finish out with. Um, one of the reasons that 62443 is, uh, is so widely accepted is that it's, it's an international standard. It's not U.S.-based or EU-based or Japan-based. So the suppliers are comfortable with the fact that they can use one standard and it's applicable uh, across the globe. And there are a lot of asset owner operators who operate internationally as well. So it's a really good fit as the foundational standard. Um, the other thing is... Uh, you know, we talk, we're looking for folks to um, uh, participate in this initiative, and I just want to remind everybody that um, ISA 99 committee participation is free. It's open. There's not a pay-to-play. Um, you don't have to be working for anybody special. Uh, it's individual contribution. So just sign up uh, on that email with Eliana Brazda that uh, Stephen showed earlier. And uh, we'd love to have as many folks uh, participating as possible. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, uh, everybody, for that great presentation and also uh, taking the time to answer some questions from the audience. Um, we also like to thank our audience members for being part of this webinar event. Uh, as mentioned, any questions submitted that we didn't answer today, uh, we will reach out. Uh, and thank you uh, for your participation. Uh, you will all be receiving an email from us with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation so you can come back and watch it again or share it with your colleagues. And lastly, please take a moment to complete a survey which will appear on your screen at the end of this live webinar. For on-demand viewers, you will find the survey located along the bottom of your attendee console in the survey widget. Again, thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar event. Take care and we'll talk with you soon.